Hello, I'm Martin Kaiser. I'm a researcher and clinician at the Institute of Cancer Research in London and the Royal Marston Hospital in London. And um, I'm happy to present to you um, our abstract that we presented as an oral presentation at this year's ASCO um, on behalf of my co-investigators as well, uh, which is um, has the title Depth of Response and Minimal Residual Disease Status in Ultra-High-Risk Multiple Myeloma and Plasma Cell Leukemia Treated with DARA-CVRD, results of the UK Optimum 9 trial. So, um, as many of you will know, currently, um, many newly diagnosed patients do receive the same kind of treatment up front. Uh, but unfortunately, 20 to 25% of patients do experience an early relapse of the disease, even if they receive intensive treatment, including a transplant. Um, that means that treatment then has to be modified post hoc, which is potentially a strain on resources, but it's really mostly stressful for patients as well. And the high tumor burden at this relapse may potentially speed up the further evolution of the disease. So what the aim really is um, of precision medicine, personalized medicine is to use improved biological risk prediction to individualize the approach, to modify the approach early, to adjust the resources to the unmet need, to improve outcomes and to empower patients as well. So, um, you might have heard already a lot about different definitions of risk in myeloma. What we really focused in in this study uh, was molecular risk. So risk that is inherent in the tumor cell based on molecular features. And there are genetic risk factors. And what has been shown in really multiple independent study groups is that the co-occurrence of several of these high-risk markers shown on the left-hand side here, which we also call double hit, is really associated with adverse outcome. And this as it means that the disease is really genomically unstable. Uh, gene expression markers have probably been less used, but they are also likewise very well validated in multiple independent data sets. And it has been shown that they are really associated with proliferation growth of the tumor, which is not really well reflected in the genetics alone. And these two markers are independent of each other. And there are some patients that can only be identified by the one or the other method uh, but uh, um, would be missed out if one did only one type of profiling. And primary plasma cell leukemia is a particularly aggressive type of disease, which again shows a high growth rate proliferation of the tumor, but also means that the myeloma gets out of the bone marrow environment and actually can survive in the bloodstream. And all these groups together have as a similarity that the disease with modern treatment and autologous stem cell transplant is on average relapsing within less than two years, meaning really that we're speaking about an ultra high risk disease group. And I think what is particularly important for patients because we're speaking a lot about risk markers, these risk markers have been diagnostically developed so they are accessible in patient care and their combined assessment can improve the risk prediction. So we wanted to really make use of that these markers are clinically developed in a prospective trial to find out whether patients with modern combination therapy uh, in ultra high risk and ultra high risk disease uh, do better. And for this, we actually took a really um, unbiased approach by running a screening trial in which all patients that had a suspected diagnosis of myeloma or primary plasma cell leukemia uh, uh, were asked to participate in those that took part, gave a bone marrow uh, sample, which was centrally in our laboratory profiled genetically in my gene expression with these uh, clinical diagnostic markers. And those that were found to have these ultra high risk markers, as well as those with primary plasma cell leukemia, were then offered participation in uh, the treatment trial. All the other patients are still being followed up as well in a standard of care real world data collection. Uh, this was important to understand that we're not losing any patients on the way uh, or maybe subgrouping the high-risk group just from certain hospitals uh, because we wanted to reflect really the real-world real situation. And what we tried to achieve with this, especially the objectives of the treatment trial, the optimum tree trial, was to evaluate the efficacy of a modern combination treatment, DARA, CVRD, plus transplant in these ultra-high-risk patients Firstly, the response and minimal residual disease after induction and transplant, which I will speak about today. 
as well as progression free survival, which is still in follow up and will be uh, presented at a later meeting. Importantly, this will be compared to a matched ultra high risk group from a very recently run trial. Safety and toxicity, of course, is also an important topic to investigate and will be presented to today. Now, the trial therapy uh, was designed to provide both high efficacy and treatment intensity for these patients that are known to progress early with current treatments, but also to be a treatment that can be delivered uh, fairly easily for patients. So we are uh, looking here at DARA CVRD as induction therapy, all of which can be delivered orally or subcutaneously, uh, followed by a uh, high dose melphalan and transplant, which has bortezomib built into it so that treatment during the long time of recovery from transplant does not cease entirely. Uh, then followed by a consolidation treatment uh, with DARA VRD, uh, dropping one element of the treatment that the patients received at the beginning at induction, moving to consolidation for 12 cycles with DARA VR, and then to maintenance with DARA and uh, Revlimid. Um, patients, whilst uh, the result for the central risk status was generated, could receive two cycles of maximum standard of care treatment. And central responses were measured, which is important because the daratumumab can lead to otherwise false positive power protein readings centrally uh, using a correction assay and central MRD was measured using flow cytometry to 10 to the minus 5 sensitivity. Now, uh, taking this unbiased approach, 472 patients were screened between 2017 and 2019 from 39 UK hospitals across the country, including district general hospitals, which are uh, not university hospitals. And uh, 128 patients were identified to have molecular ultra high risk disease, as well as 10 patients with primary plasma cell leukemia. And it was offered to them to participate in the treatment trial and 107 patients consented to this trial and were eligible as well. As you can see in the graph below, um, this trial recruited nine months ahead of schedule uh, to completion, which really is a signal that a, um, it is feasible to deliver such a risk-adapted trial, but also that there is a high unmet need for such studies. On the right-hand side, um, we have listed the characteristics, which are actually not too dissimilar from a normal population that is fit for intensive treatment, which was the only condition really to take part in this trial. But I think it reflects the real-world uh, patient population with some patients uh, having a performance status of two, which means that they are not completely fit, which uh, I think is quite a common thing as it can be caused uh, by ultra high risk disease that patients are just not feeling well. And on the bottom of this table on the right hand side, you can see that patients, about half of patients had these double hit genetics and about nearly 80% of patients a gene expression high risk signature with that overlapping in about 30% of patients. So um, this is a bit technical chart, but it shows that um, as happens with many clinical trials, uh, not all patients reached uh, the different treatment time points. So of the 107 that were considered and started on the treatment, 100 completed induction. Unfortunately, we saw uh, some early myeloma, very early myeloma related infections, which is probably a reflection of the immune suppression of the disease at that point, as well as some early progression, but also patients that just didn't tolerate therapy. Uh, and uh, 89 patients completed the autologous stem cell transplant with, again, uh, a relatively no, low number of patients, but some patients progressing despite the very intensive uh, treatment approach taken here, showing that we have really selected a uh, really aggressive disease population with our prospective approach. Nevertheless, we uh, could report that uh, patients receive a 94% of patients an overall response rate uh, of PR or better uh, after induction uh, with 80% reaching a VGPR or better and 22% a complete response. And after uh, transplant, um, the overall response rate was 83% with 
a near over doubling of the complete response rate of 40, 47%. Now that's really taking all the patients into account that enrolled into the trial. These numbers are inherently higher on the right-hand side. If we're only considering these patients that did tolerate the treatment and were able to continue on trial, as well as those that progressed with an overall response rate of 99% after induction and 93% after transplant with 52% complete remissions after transplant. On the bottom right-hand side corner, you see that primary plasma cell leukemia patients uh, still unfortunately had a uh, lower response rate with 75% overall response rate and 25% CRs. Now the minimal residual disease status uh, showed that 41% of patients reached MRD negativity at the end of induction and 64% MRD negativity after transplant. Um, in total, it was 40% of patients as well that had a complete response and MRD negativity, but we saw over time that several of the patients with ongoing analysis that were MRD negative also developed a complete response um, later down the line. Um, again, this was in relation to all the patients that took part in the trial. If we're looking only at those that actually reached the respective time points and had a measurable MRD, so also an adequate sample, sent to bone marrow sample, was 50% MRD negativity after induction and 82% after transplant. So um, adverse events, uh, and listed here are those that have a slightly higher grade of two, so slightly more intensive um, side effects, and that occurred in more than 5% of patients, are probably pretty much of what we would expect with such a combination therapy and is similar to what has been uh, reported in other trials with such combination treatments. Uh, we know that hematologically, our treatment always uh, takes a certain burden with neutropenia occurring in 20% uh, of grade four, uh, three or four, but this is normally very well manageable as well as this trial. Um, and we saw about 12% of patients developing a grade three or four infection which required um, uh, intensive treatment, uh, not, on, uh, uh, not in the sense that the patient needed uh, really intensive care, but um, IV antibiotics or oral antibiotics. Um, there was a relatively low grade of neuropathy despite Valcade being used in this trial and other uh, toxicities were similar to uh, similar trials. Now, the trial is still ongoing. Um, it's not recruiting anymore, but uh, of course, further analysis will be done. And I think it's one of the specifics of this trial, which a lot of care was taken in the design phase, is that we did not want to only generate data that was a standalone data on this treatment, but we wanted to compare it as well. Uh, and our excellent trial citations came up with a digital comparative solution where we use a very recently reported trial that was run at the UK, the Milam 11 trial, and really um, a trial for which we did exactly the same uh, molecular diagnostic tests so that we can compare the same ultra high risk patients from this trial against those that are enrolled in this new trial. And hopefully this will give us a really um, um, more solid data uh, supporting a new approach. Um, this will use Bayesian statistics and is scheduled to read out uh, later in this year. But we of course want to also take a look uh, on the patient perspective, so quality of life and patient reported outcomes, as well as utility questionnaires. So did patients find this treatment useful that they received here will be evaluated in the trial. We're also looking at um, uh, imaging-based MRD using multicenter diffusion-weighted imaging, which is really a new innovative method of uh, assessing disease after, trans after treatment. Um, so in summary, I think it's important to highlight that um, this is a prospective trial. So we did not look just back into trials that have run, analyzing the um, risk status of patients retrospectively, but we identified these patients upfront in an unbiased fashion and offered treatment to those with high-risk disease. Uh, we did observe a really deep remissions in those patients receiving this new treatment with dira CVRD and bortezomib augmented transplant. We found that this induction treatment is safe and well tolerated, uh, but unfortunately, um, and probably reflecting that we have really identified the true ultra high risk patient groups, some patients still relapsed early despite this very modern therapy, and there is further work that needs to be done. We hope that 
this trial will be one in a row of many and uh, that really we can focus further on these groups with an unmet need um, with trial designs like this that really use a comparative design that is patient friendly by using digital comparator arms. There were of course a lot of people that contributed to this, both uh, investigators, my co-chief investigator, Dr. Jenner, um, the statistical teams, um, lots of laboratory studies, of course, and imaging studies, other trial groups in the UK, um, but of course also the industry collaborators and our funders that contributed to this, but last not least, the investigators and the patients, families and carers. Thank you very much for your attention.